All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another one of our uh, US, US Coast Guard Academy Alumni Association Lunch and Learns. Um, sorry for the delay. You know, we've got a couple of things going on this week. Uh, com commencement is tomorrow. And of course, uh, we also started our annual giving challenge uh, today, actually. So, um, but before we get started, I do have a couple of rules of the road. Um, Number one, uh, you are on mute by default, uh, but feel free to use the chat functions for any questions or uh, comments you may have. And um, lastly, the uh, forum, this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be shared uh, for anyone who's, who's unable to make it today. Uh, so today we, uh, the today's topic is alumni reads uh, and about the book, uh, all present and accounted for. And today we are um, welcomed with by the author, Captain Stephen Craig, uh, as well as uh, Commander Chris Ensley, who's class of 20, 2004, and um, who's going to be monitoring today's session. Hey, uh, thanks, so Austin. Can you give me a thumbs up that you can hear me? Perfect, yeah. thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you, Captain Craig, for, uh, for agreeing to join us this afternoon. And thanks to all the shipmates and the alumni that are out there. Uh, this is an exciting topic. Um, I, my name is Chris Inslee. I'm a career cutterman. I've spent almost a decade at sea, and I'm currently stationed at the Office of Cutter Forces here at headquarters in Washington, D.C., where we help manage cutter capabilities and policy. And I, I read Captain Craig's book about a year ago, and it struck me as an uncomfortable read. Um, it, was, it was a good book, but it was uncomfortable in the sense that I could see both the crews I've worked on and been a part of, and I could see other crews in the Coast Guard engendering themselves in this difficult and tragic uh, situation that the Jarvis crew went through. Um, this is a famous case, uh, so much so that they still teach the flooding of the Jarvis in uh, the commanding officer and executive officer class for all the people going to be the commanding officers and executive officers of our ships. And on the different ships I've served on, we use this case as a case study when we walk our junior officers and our engineers through understanding damage control. And so I was really glad to read the book, but it also struck really close to home knowing that this type of thing is still possible and that these risks still exist for our mariners today. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce Captain Stephen Craig uh, who wrote this book. And sir, I was hoping uh, if you could take just a minute to introduce yourself and then if you could walk us through the background of this case and tell us a little bit about the mishap that the Jarvis went through in uh, 1972. Over to you, Captain. Hey, morning. Good to talk to you. Um, especially there's a couple people in here that uh, I know already, Zeke Lyons and, and uh, Bob Carmack I've served with before. And then Admiral Hollingsworth is uh, on as well from what I understand. He was the second commanding officer to the Jarvis. So uh, he provides some valuable input and I welcome him to this as well. Again, I'm Steve Craig. I retired out of the Coast Guard Reserve. I did uh, 38 years active in reserve and in 2000, a little bit background, 2018, uh, I retired from everything. And, and this story I had heard about in 1973 when I was a YN3 at Base Honolulu and ran across a crew member who came from the Jarvis. The Jarvis was in dry dock and he told me the story. I'm thinking to myself, you know, I never even heard of this. And the story stuck with me all those years so that when 2018, I decided to write a magazine article and it sort of exploded into a book. I interviewed 35, uh, at least 35 former crew members. I interviewed people that were part of the air support, the C-130 pilots. I also flew down to, to San Bruno uh, where the archive center was gracious enough to provide me records of the ship logs. And then when I took the interviews of the crew members, then I matched it up to the timelines that was in the ship logs. And that's how I determined the timelines in the book. I was uh, getting ready, I wrote this book a little over two years ago, and I was getting ready to do a book tour. And of course we had COVID hit uh, a month before I was supposed to start tour. So for two years, I've had 250 books sitting in my closet. So I finally got started on my book tour last week. I was up in Alaska. I hit five different presentations and book signings up there. So it's off to a good start. And this is just a picture here of the Jarvis. I've got some pictures I submitted uh, to the commander, just random pictures that I had on, on file. Probably one of the questions I was asked the most was, uh, 
Um, again, you know, why the Jarvis? And again, it's, it goes back to 1973 when I was told that story. A little bit about the background. Um, Jarvis was the Coast Guard's newest ship. And in late 72, it went up to Alaska to do the first uh, fishery tour up there and visit different ports, Dutch Harbors, uh, St. Paul, Ketchikan, uh, Anchorage. And they departed Anchorage. And it was right after that that they started having uh, the issues came up. November 14th, they were seeking shelter. They went to Alaska because a crew member had a dental issue and they sought shelter in the harbor there uh, where they had a storm strike ship later in the evening. And for whatever reason, the, the, they had a boot ensign on as the, in command and uh, he had been told if anything happened, they'd go get the captain. The captain had been awake for 30 straight hours and needed some rest. And for whatever reason, the incident delayed to the point where when the captain did go up on the bridge, they were only minutes away from grounding. They tore a small hole in the bottom, the engine room filled with three or four feet of water. And they shorted it up. And they got the, the flighting to a minimum. And then the captain and senior staff and, and some senior enlisted got together and asked the question whether they should head back to Honolulu or just stay where they were at. And they decided to, to proceed the next day. Uh, I know some of the junior enlisted were in disbelief, but they were junior enlisted, but those same junior enlisted later became senior officers in the Coast Guard. And, and they disagree with it, but uh, again, it was the senior people on board that gave recommendation they, they head back. So they headed back and uh, they got out to open sea. And the XO uh, was Commander Ken White, and he had he had written a paper about this years later. And he said they when they got out to open seas, it was the most tremendous seas he had ever seen. And Commander White uh, was a Navy veteran. He, uh, you know, at age 15, he illegally went into the Navy because he wanted to serve the country. And it wasn't until a few months later when he sent a postcard back to his family from Australia, they figured out where he was at, and Navy booted him out. And then a couple of years later, he went back in a 70 year old with his dad's permission. But, and he was also recognized one time as the most decorated officer we had in the Coast Guard. Big guy, weighed about 300 pounds. Uh, wouldn't have been able to be in today, but he was a big guy, somewhat intimidating. His leadership was the opposite of Captain Woolley, who was in charge. Captain Woolley was like, sort of like Tom Hanks. Uh, he would stop crew members in the hallway and ask them how their family were and, and uh, a very caring officer had extensive maritime background. He served uh, 10 years in maritime service. Came in the Coast Guard because he came home early one day and, and uh, his uh, small daughter I went running away from him, screaming at mom that she didn't know who the strange man was. So that was his reason for getting out of the Merchant Marines and coming into the Coast Guard. And because of his extensive background, uh, he was selected to be the first commanding officer for the Jarvis. There's also rumors, I talked to his daughter uh, he passed away in 2000, but uh, uh, she, she, he had mentioned he had participated in D-Day invasion at, with the Merchant Marines, but I couldn't find anything official on that. Just to talk about the, the environment itself, uh, what they had to endure. It was extremely cold, rain, sleet, snow, driving winds, high seas. At one point in the pitch of the night, uh, they went to a turn and they hit a wave that put the ship at a 60 degree angle. And I, I've had a couple of people say that's pretty unrealistic, but it's in the official records. And, and the people I talked to that were on board said, yeah, they said one minute you're walking on the deck, the next minute you were walking on the bulkhead, wondering what was going on. We at waves were 30, 60 feet high. Again, the uh, sleet, fur, furies, uh, freezing conditions on board. One of the, uh, uh, disgusting, but I mean, you know, water flows downhill and, and uh, the head, the bathroom upstairs had, had overflowed and was overflowing. And the, uh, the enlisted, junior enlisted uh, birthing was below the head. So imagine how bad it was down in that birthing area. But they were taking a pounding from Mother Nature with a ship rocking back and forth, uh, gusts up 50 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. And then uh, finally, uh, they, they, the engine room filled with 13 feet of water and the ship was now perilous and they were heading toward Akatan Island, uh, toward the rocky shoreline. And the command there had basically felt that if they went aground, uh, they would lose 80 to 100% of the crew members would die between 
uh, just the freezing water conditions, the rocky shoreline, no place to shelter over there. So there was uh, there was some um, to talk about releasing the life rafts, uh, but the, when they tried to do that, it turns out they were frozen to the ship because of freezing conditions. And there was also uh, members such as Commander Brunke, he was a BM3 at the time, he'd already made up his mind, he was going down with the ship. He said, there's no way he was getting in that life raft. He, he'd take, he figured he'd take his uh, odds with the, uh, life, with the ship. That picture right there is Akatan Island. On the other side of the island, it's interesting, it's Trident Seafoods, uh, one of the largest fish processing plants you know, in the US. And I think that it was like 3 million fish a day that process, unbelievable amount of fish they process at that plant. Um, I just uh, read, uh, the board investigation was conducted. The, the ship was saved. Uh, Japanese trawler answered the SOS. Uh, there was, uh, they were the closest one. There was also another Japanese trawler a little bit further away. And they, 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 they were heading that way as well. Uh, they, the Japanese trawler came, uh, they notified the ship they could be there in, in 30 minutes. Unfortunately, the command had figured out they'd be on the rocky shorelines by then. So the, the command had to take a lot of steps uh, with the chiefs to figure out how to slow the ship down uh, so they wouldn't crash upon uh, Akatan Island. The ship arrived uh, just in time uh, in mountainous seas, uh, just terrible conditions. They managed to uh, send messenger over to get the tow line back and forth. Uh, Brunke had mentioned that uh, the seamanship of the Japanese captain was was unbelievable. So there's a couple times they thought the ship was going to crash right into the Jarvis, uh, but uh, the guy was uh, just fantastic skipper. And, and then uh, six eight months later in Honolulu, they presented that captain with an award from the Coast Guard. So, Captain, this is uh, this is Chris Ensley again. So understanding the, the the ship took on significant water in the engine room so much that the engine stopped uh, stopped working. They had literally smashed off the sonar dome of the ship, um, and they're headed for the rocks. And fortunately, this uh, Japanese trawler shows up at the last minute. What are the things that the crew did that managed to save this ship and keep it floating and keep it off the rocks? until that Japanese trawler uh, could get there. What are those lessons learned and the, the mindset of the crew that enabled them to stay alive and keep fighting until that trawler got there to, uh, to save the day? Uh, over. Over to they you. Tried, they, they were trying a variety of things. They were um, working with the bow thrust to slow it down. There's also some called a seed drogue. You familiar with that? It's not Very like much just so. a large parachute or something you put in the water to slow it down. So it was just a combination of a lot of that uh, efforts that they tried. They, they were trying everything. Uh, again, it came down to probably the experience of the chiefs. Chief uh, Stanswick was very instrumental. Uh, Jack Hunter was uh, just as instrumental. The chiefs were fantastic. Uh, Warrant Officer Montgomery. Again, it was a lot of experience that uh, enabled them to slow the ship down. And they attribute a lot of it to the train that got down there at Honolulu before they embarked up to Hawaii or Alaska. So, Cam, that's that's what I took away when I read the book was two elements that really allowed them to stay alive. The first I saw was the train, the fact that they had gone through a very extensive uh, certification period once they received the ship in the shipyard. They'd come to Hawaii. They'd been certified and actually earned the Battle E in all four areas. Um, and that that uh, training, that they knew the systems on board and knew how to fight damage um, was one element. And then the other element was that mindset, the fact that they did not give up, that the chiefs and the other senior uh, enlisted and uh, even at the junior officer levels and the captain, they refused to give up their ship. And when people were falling out, they pushed back um, and got those people back in the fight to keep things going. And whether it was the cooks, whether it was the engineers, or whether it was the bridge crew, everyone kept doing their jobs to keep this ship afloat. Um, uh, I, I'd ask you, sir, if you have any other comments on that. And I think we can push this out and see if anybody in the audience has any questions. Well, sir. One, of the, one of the things that uh, several of the senior enlisted, first class chiefs, whatever, uh, they saw right away that 
people are starting to get despondent and, and sit in the corner and, and, and be depressed. And immediately they started doing was like doing bucket brigades of hauling water overboard. They said one of the key things is keeping them busy. Uh, quartermaster up on the bridge noticed the, a third class quartermaster was sitting in the corner sulking and he immediately started yelling at the guy. He said, get over here and help me with the charting. It's, it's just a matter of keeping them busy, keep them focused on saving the ship and not just uh, worrying about dying. You got to concentrate on living. There we go. Am I? Yeah, I think I'm off mute. Ah, yeah. Um, yes, sir. A absolutely. And I, I think uh, that element that they're pushing each other to get back in the fight was critical. They talk about in damage control training, whatever you do, the first rule of damage control, you don't give up the ship, you keep going. And that's things that our chiefs teachers are, they, they teach our crews every single day on board our cutter fleet with the 8,000 people we currently have assigned to ships. Um, uh, sir, I, I, before, uh, I've got some more questions for you that I'm interested in hearing about, but I'd love to see if our, uh, our alumni have any questions. Austin, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how we can take this out to the audience, Austin, but uh, if anybody from the audience has a question, we'd love to hear from you. Over to you, Austin. Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, as, as Commander Ensley mentioned, you know, um, we'd be happy to take any questions we have uh, in the chat box. Uh, feel free to message and, and write your questions there. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add here, looking at this slide here, this slide everybody can see, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just go around. I'm, there's one of the pictures of the engine room with uh, water in the engine room. It's not uh, 13 feet high, but give you a little bit of idea of the water. And then they have a damaged propeller there to give you an idea of the size of the propeller compared to the size of the men. And then the bottom left hand picture is Captain Woolley and Chair. They had a reunion several years afterwards, and that some of the crew members went over there to say hi to them, including two obvious uh, twins, the Bomb Brothers, who were not on board. Yeah. They were on leave. Hey, Captain, uh, we've got a question from David Hal about uh, if the crew tried to set their anchors or was it too deep at that location? I think uh, in addition to Mr. Hal's question, do you think you could talk a little bit about the um, what led to the grounding and what was the initial cause of the initial flooding um, when they were initially anchored and uh, how the captain's fatigue and the, uh, the navigational picture was compromised and kind of led to the initial mishap, sir. Over. Well, they thought they, they had anchored in this spot a month before, and they thought it was it was a good place to anchor. And I guess it, even today, they, they've got less as not a good place to anchor. But they basically had anchored in, in mud. And the ship uh, started dragging anchor a little bit. And then uh, several of these uh, members of the crew later on would come, you know, work in the maritime field for 40, 50 years. And several comment, they, they believed it was a result the ship went aground was because of this willow wall, which is a severe wind that comes tearing down the side of the mountain and then hits the water. And it's, I, I never even heard of a willow wall until I started researching this, but the people with the most experience, and even if you're talking other experts from Alaska, Alaska, willow wall is a serious event that will cause a ship to, to uh, move. And, and uh, you go on YouTube, and to see what will wall, you can see what effects of a will wall could have. But a lot of them felt that was what caused the ship to drag anchor. And it started dragging anchor and the ensign failed to notify the captain right away to the point where the, when the captain did come up on the bridge, it was too late, the, they scraped bottom. And it wasn't that big of a hole, but they, uh, they, they managed to anchor and then they managed to shore it up and they had very minimal uh, flooding at that time. Where Captain Woolley uh, received a, uh, was found at fault, was not staying there and, and getting assistance. Uh, they say basically he traded yeah. a, a, a bad position for a worse one when he went out to open sea. And that is where they found him at fault and gave him a punitive letter of censure and he lost command because of that uh, action. Yeah. And one of the things I saw in reading the case, sir, was uh, that uh, this is, it's important to remember this is the early 1970s. Ships don't have the GPS system. This island or this bay where they were anchored didn't have a lot of light, so they weren't able to triangulate their position using uh, the alidades. Instead, they were using radar-based fixes, and the, uh, the plotted radar rings were not um, entirely accurate. 
the wind was blowing so hard, it was interfering with their, the accuracy of the radar in that evening. And so I think for that bridge crew, there was also an element of it was hard to understand that they were, uh, they were dragging anchor because they didn't have a clear navigation picture, which when you have that uh, distortion in navigation, that's one of the immediate signs you're supposed to notify uh, the captain and the XO and the operations officer. I think there was a chain of errors that if they had intervened sooner, uh, hopefully they would have been able to get it uh, and prevent some of this mishaps. Um, so we have another question from uh, Mr. Frank McNiff about what were the findings of the Board of Inquiry and what were the cause and uh, what changes were made across the fleet as a result of this mishap? Over to you, Captain. Yeah, I have to look this up. Uh, the Board of Investigation had quite uh, a lot of findings. Um, give me a second here. Um, The board found that uh, from operational viewpoint, uh, basic, the basic cause of the grinding was high winds on November 15th, and then failure to follow standard policies uh, and improper maneuvering of the vessel during the, uh, the weighting of the anchor. Uh, several, again, several members later on would say that the uh, will wall was definitely what caused the grounding. The anchor chain, one of the find the anchor chain was not hosed off as it was brought in, unable to read. Uh, when they questioned the, the Bosome chief about that later on, um, they asked why that wasn't. He, and he had somewhat sarcastically mentioned, he says, I don't know uh, why I couldn't read it, you know, between the wind and the ice and the rain, the sleet and the snow and sh ship uh, rocking back and forth. I don't know why I couldn't read it. But, uh, um, a little bit, uh, that wasn't in the board of investigation. I talked to the chief, he lives down in Florida now. Uh, they said consideration, uh, uh, there was in, insufficient cement on board. Uh, There's consideration about using that to help the quick drying cement to help shore up the, the hole, but they yeah. didn't have any cement. So one of the recommendations from the board was to have 600 pounds of cement on board ships. I, I don't know if that's done today or not. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we, we do have very extensive damage control lockers on all ships. I, I, I can't get into what's specifically in them off the top of my head, but we do have a lot of damage control equipment across every single one of our cutters. Yeah, good. And maybe, yeah, I don't know what, I'm not privy to what changes were made after Jarvis. Yeah. Yeah, you probably have a lot better input on that. Uh, one of the keys finding, again, I mentioned, the decision to leave the sheltered uh, waters was erroneous and the responsibility therefore fell on the captain. And again, that's one of the main uh, uh, findings they had. There was a radar antenna drive mechanism um, that they felt was inadequate, especially for Alaska condi weather conditions. So I yep. would imagine that was corrected. Yeah. Um, captain, can you talk a little bit about uh, how the Jarvis went on? And I know you mentioned this in the epilogue of your book, but how it went on to do great things over the rest of its, uh, you know, 40 years of storied existence and how um, it's still providing value today. The crew didn't give up the ship. They saved the Jarvis and they saved their lives in doing so. And because of that, uh, this ship has been an asset to America or was an asset to America until 2012-ish. Um, but it's still doing great things with one of our allies. Can you, can you talk a little bit about some of the stuff it's done since then? and how saving that ship uh, enabled us to have that asset? Yeah, I put uh, toward the back book, I put down basically uh, the various uh, captains of the Jarvis and, and some of their background and some of the missions that they accomplished. In 2012, uh, the ship was uh, decommissioned. A few months short after that, it was signed over to the Bangladesh Navy where it serves today. Here's a picture of it uh, being turned over, but it was, um, uh, it still serves today. I've tried to get hold of, uh, reach out to the ship there. I haven't had a lot, a lot of luck in that. Uh, I had some contacts in here back. Uh, but it's it was under a ship transfer program. A lot of the, we don't have any 378s any, anymore. A lot of them were signed over to other countries like Vietnam and Philippines and probably a couple of other countries as well. But it, very, it had a very distinguished career. Uh, it, one interesting story was, on his final tour back to, uh, I believe, San Diego, 
the uh, engineering officer called down the commanding officer, I believe it's Captain Mallory, and said, sir, we have a problem in the engine room. So he goes down there. There was actually a hole uh, in, the, in the engine room that had been uh, patched up with wood around like corked wood and then sanded and painted and nobody had ever noticed it. And so the captain ordered to ship back to Honolulu where they, uh, he, he was not comfortable with going clear across Pacific with this uh, wood patch that had been there for 20, 30 years. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, well, hey, sir, we're wrapping up our time here. I really appreciate you putting this book together um, uh, and providing kind of this historical look at one of the important cases that all sailors are, are taught as they, uh, they move about our ships today. And so thank you for doing that. What, um, let me just ask you one more quick question. What's your next project? What are you going to be taking on next as you keep diving through the annals of Coast Guard history, sir? Well, I find that marketing takes up three times more time than writing the book, maybe more than that. Uh, I'm looking at another book similar to uh, Jarvis. Uh, one idea is to write a series of short stories, put one book about uh, near disasters where nobody was ki killed, you know, feel good stories. Um, I, uh, I, I had a final comment here that I just read off is uh, as often stated in maritime circles, and an accident at sea is a result of a series of mistakes. You talk to anybody involved in accidents, it's always a series. In this case, the errors and circumstances were numerous. It was an inexperienced incident on the bridge, the failure to notify the captain promptly of the ship's movement, radar issues that obscured the position, and illegible markings on the anchor chain from the mud. Other factors including the ship's selected location from, for safe harbor, harbor from the weather and navigational decisions, Critical per personnel missing. A couple of them were back in Honolulu or going to school. When you consider the severe weather, including the notorious severe wind walls and extremely cold, dry, icy, windy, wet conditions, and extremely high sea waves, you have the makings of a disastrous situ situation. And it just re reiterate that the overall summary from what I gather is uh, it was leadership, experience, and training that saved the ship. Yeah. Well, uh Sir, I think we have time for another 30 seconds. Mr. Howell asked us one more question. He was wondering if you could touch on the attempts by uh, our friends in the aviation community to drop uh, how that worked out when they were trying to drop pumps and other supplies to the ship. If you had any background on that, I know you mentioned it in the book and that there were numerous unsuccessful attempts and then some successful. Uh, if you could just touch on that briefly before uh, we move, turn this back over to Austin. Over to you, sir. Yeah, one of the issues they had was receiving these uh, 55 gallon barrels of fuel or oil uh, being dropped on the ship in, in terrible conditions, ships rocking back and forth. And so the, uh, some of the people on deck got the idea of putting up a safety net and then maybe help secure the net a little bit better. And, and uh, the uh, uh, C-130 dropped the barrel down on the deck and scraping, sparking, heading toward the net. And, these guys all of a sudden thought, you know, this thing's going, I think, at flying at 70 knots. And they all of a sudden start diving for cover, realizing that wasn't the brightest idea they had. But it was extremely challenging to get the, the oil on, on board, the fuel that they needed. Uh, and just reading about the uh, Lieutenant Hullison was the pilot on board, and he's one that just miraculously uh, uh, got the helicopter off the ship. And just that in alone is quite a riveting story. And a lot of that came from his comments. He, uh, uh, he unfortunately passed away back in December, but he had written like a seven page uh, news article about appeared in an aviation magazine. He, he did receive an award for his actions during this event, but it's quite riveting his story. And then I got some stories from some C-130 pilots. Uh, one story was how they had dropped the, the fuel on board. And then the, him and the co-pilot looked back at the ship and the ship had so many lights on it, so bright that it blinded the pilot and co-pilot uh, for a couple uh, seconds, minute. And uh, they had to head out to sea away from the mountains because they couldn't see and, and until they got their sight back and then they came back. But just some, uh, it's just amazing stories that uh, people, just supporting assets had. Yes, sir. Aviators have good sea stories too on occasion. Um, yeah. Captain, thank you so much for your time today and for putting this book together. I personally really appreciate it, and I know a lot of our other listeners do too. 
And uh, Austin, thank you and the Alumni Association for setting this up. Back to you, Austin. No worries. Thank you, Commander Ensley. And, and thank you, Captain Craig, again, you know, for sharing your, you know, all these wonderful stories and, and, and insightful stories. Um, what, what, where, where can people, you know, learn more about you? Um, and, and where can people find the book? Well, I've got a website. It's uh, www.stephenjcraigbooks.com. I'd put my middle initial in there because stephencraigbooks.com was taken. So uh, that, that was, uh, anyway, that's my website. Uh, you can get the book on Amazon. There's over 174 reviews on it right now, 81% are five stars. So it's done quite well. Uh, they can also, if you go to my website, you know, send me an email, you can buy a book directly from me if you want to do it that way as well. Uh, so, and th there's my phone number and email address up there as well. All right, awesome. And, and thank you, thank you both once again. And, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, and have a great afternoon. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. All right. Thank Take you. Care.